pointlessness is the beauty of it. We're not training, we're not racing, we're not doing anything that hasn't been done before. We're not fucking making a million dollars. We're just riding our bikes. You can go harder when you're not really doing it for a reason. You're just out there laying it on the line for the sake of doing it because you enjoy doing that. So you just want to push yourself even harder and it doesn't matter if you blow up. You're not going to be at the ass of a bike race. In 2013, my brother Lachlan and I rode halfway across Australia in search of adventure. That trip led me to pursue a life in cycling again after years of running away from it and almost did the opposite for Lachlan. 18 months later and we're doing it all again. This time we've traded the red dirt of Australia's outback for the jagged cliffs of America's Rocky Mountains as we ride from Boulder, Colorado to Moab, Utah. Fascinated by the characters in cycling and the fact that we know more about an athlete's sunglasses than their personality, we've decided to bring along a couple of mates in Camworth and Taylor Finney. The route's tentative because we've had a bit of, of snow um, that we didn't forecast for. It's five days to Moab. It's ambitious, but definitely an achievable route. Colorado has amazing roads. This is my favorite place to ride a bike in the world. And the finish point in Moab, it's rich mountain bike history. It's an amazing place in the desert, it's just cool. The first thereabouts was Australian outback. It's hot, it's dry, it's isolated, and it's, it's dead flat. A complete contrast to the Rocky Mountains. It's snowing, it's raining, it's only just above freezing. You're climbing elevations up to 4,000 metres. Like whilst it's no more gruelling than the Australian outback, it's, it's a complete antithesis and so it requires a whole different skill set and you have to approach it a whole different way. At the start of last year I did a, a, a big ride with a mate Richie Port on his birthday. We just set out in the morning, came back 403 kilometres later and just like was the most amazing day on the bike and then just made me realise and you know the, the beauty of just riding and I'd never had the luxury of doing that. Started the sport quite late, was rushed into it and so the opportunity to do something like this it's really exciting I mean that for me cycling is the world's greatest leveler you know you're just people riding a push bike you know everything else goes away and so you know adventures like this are yeah just priceless so can't wait to get into it. When I was maybe 11 uh, in the winters I was playing soccer all I wanted to do was be a free skier, but that was sort of early ages of free skiing with guys like Shane McConkey, um, Johnny Mosley, Chris Davenport, and they were they were doing stuff on skis that had never been done before. You know, they were going backwards and they were doing uh, you know multiple backflips. So what I see with thereabouts is this sort of cycling equivalent to this lifestyle that I wanted when I was a kid, which was just to be able to create things that inspire young kids to ride bikes and, and to ride bikes in a different way than, you know, Chris Froome winning the Tour de France. As we're set to depart, Cam, who arrived in the early hours of this morning, hastily throws his new bike together in order to make the start of the ride. So I just literally, literally pulled that out of the bag when you saw me pull it out of the bag. It was the first time I'd seen it. So I did a quick, I don't know, probably about 30, 50 metres up the hill and back to make sure the position was right. So I'm assuming it's good. It's not like anyone else has really ridden one either. So we have no idea what the bike will do out there either, which is quite fitting for this adventure because we have no idea what's going to happen to any of us. I think this is the grander part. We're going from here to Breckenridge today. It's pretty cold, it's pretty wet. It's got about 90 miles uh, distance. And it will probably take us about seven hours or something. Everyone's in pretty good spirits. Cam got in like two in the morning and it's uh, substantially, well he came from sea level. So, and we're at altitude here and we're going to a really high altitude. So he's positive now, but I think he's going to be hurting a little bit later on in the day. <laughs> So I'll take pleasure in that.
I always played soccer when I was a kid. Uh, I played soccer until I was like 15, and my parents were cyclists. My, my dad won a, a bronze medal in the Olympics, won a couple of stages of the Tour de France, and my mom won an Olympic gold medal, and she actually retired the next day after that, which I always thought was the coolest thing. So I always had bikes around in my life, but I never thought that I should race them. We moved to Italy when I was 12, and, and I started playing soccer there, and I kind of realized that I wasn't gonna be Ronaldo. And then I started riding my bike in, in the summer in 2004, 2005, and I also went to the Tour de France with my dad, and he had this press pass, so we got to go inside and meet all the riders, and you know, got to meet Lance, got to meet Axel Merckx, Robbie McEwen, these big heroes uh, of cycling back back at that time, and I was like, "Whoa, this is a cool, this is a cool thing. This isn't just like this stupid sport that my parents did. It's like something that I could do too." So I I started riding a lot, and 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 decided when we moved back to America that I wanted to race, and so I just started to race and started to win, and and from that point forward, you know, it's pretty clear that that was what I wanted to do. That was fun. <laughs> I take it you guys came down fast. Yeah, it's just the right amount of money. It's a whole different gripping. animal with these yeah. things, man. I know, dude, you can go so fast with that shit. Yeah. 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 Waiting for Cam, waiting for the wild card. The wild card, man. <laughs> when I was going down the descent, I was like, I just don't feel like I'm in the center of the road here. Yeah, something feels a bit off. Yeah, it's only about half a centimeter out. Yeah, exactly. A mechanical. Huh? Ah, uh, guys, check this out. <laughs> I didn't even do it in the front brake. <laughs> <laughs> what were you about to say? Like I didn't even drop my skewer. That's cool. Yeah. I was going to drive my. Yeah. That's product testing for you, right there, boys. No wonder you're so slow. Man. Yeah. Last year in May in, in 2014, as so I was racing at the national championships in in Chattanooga, I was doing the road race. We were going down this hill, and I was going a bit too fast, but there was, there was some other things happened. There was a motorcycle commissary moto that wasn't paying attention, and I just ended up having to divert around this motorcycle, but it was at a really inopportune time, and I couldn't take this corner, left-hand corner, the way that I wanted to take it, so I came into it way too fast, and I ended up sliding out and hitting a guardrail. I have the SRM file, and I looked at it. It's like 97 kilometers an hour. So I went from 97 kilometers an hour to a dead stop and uh, broke my tibia in half. I broke my patella, um, severed my patellar tendon. I also ruptured my PCL, uh, which is like your ACL, but not quite as important. You know, did I just end my career? Am I gonna have, you know, immediately your mind starts racing. It's like, do I, am I gonna have to go back to school? Like, am I ever gonna be able to walk again? I knew that I really messed myself up. You know, I was just kind of like, buckle up, buddy. Like, this is going to be a long ride. And the first couple weeks were really tough. But beyond that, like, I thought I was going to be back racing in September of that year. And uh, I had no idea that it was going to be like a year, year and a half. Are you with the bicyclist? I'm with yeah. this gentleman okay. here. Yeah. What, what, what do you want to talk about? Are you guys all together? Or? Yeah. Hey, okay. the reason I stopped you guys is it looked to me like he was trying to pass you, but clearly he's with you guys. Ah, right. So you're uh, doing 40 and a 45 below the speed yeah. limit. You're in the lane of travel when you should be on the shoulder in that sense. Yeah. So how the law works out here is if you're on a cycle that's going the speed limit, right. a car shouldn't pass you, but you weren't. No, that's, we got to go faster. You're pretty close. That's, uh, that's a good training. Yeah, motivation absolutely. for us. We need to just ride a bit quicker. So is that the law? So if we can go the same speed as the car, that means we can just sit in the lane with the car. Let's well, just it's, listen. It's not and black and white yeah. like that. Okay. That's how some look at it. it. Others don't yeah. look at it that way. Right. Okay. okay. No, that's but that's cool. how I interpret it. Awesome. It hasn't been tested. Right it hasn't though. been tested in court. No. So he's got pulled over. Thankfully, the 
Thankfully, Sergeant Wheeler is a legend. So he's not Chad booking us or anything. <laughs> First bit of drama. Okay, here's the about deal. 80Ks in. Uh, verbal warnings only today, okay? And then Sweet. I gotta get you logged in so everybody can stand by, at yep. least yep. you two. Mm. And yep. then we'll get you guys out of here in about five minutes, maybe less. Dodge the law. Central City has this strange law, you're not actually allowed to ride a bike in the town. So, there's this stretch you have to walk. And we just had a brush with the law, so we don't want to piss them off anymore. <laughs> so we're like, walking our bikes like scalded kids. <laughs> the walk, we get time to look at the map, make sure we make it on the Oh My God Road. Right down to Idaho Springs. The weather's looking a little gnarly, but we knew that was gonna happen. We just saw the sign for a little bit. That was a surprise. The last year's been a pretty wild ride. It's been pretty eye-opening. Uh, I had to kind of remove myself completely from the cycling world. You know, I took my rehab and everything really seriously. I put everything that I'd learned as a cyclist, I took that and I put that into my recovery, um, that's something that you hear a lot of athletes say. Uh, so maybe I'm just regurgitating some, some bullshit that I heard in, a, in an interview. You're on the pedals all day. Oh, sweet. Sweet. Um, and so you're on the pedals all day, and then you, just, you know that you've got this big <laughs> fucking climb up here. Yeah. So you're sort of like, you fucked already, I'm moving there. But that's fun. Tell you what, and it's gonna be fucking cold up there, too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah man. Yeah, I'm pretty lucky. Yeah, you're yeah, lucky, yeah. Like, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna say it. No, nah, we can't say it. Say it. Well, we, we failed to exercise the, the one thing that we should have, which is common sense, when we came across some snow about three kilometres back. We didn't realise it was a sign of what's to come, although we were continually to climb in elevation. So we only have ourselves to blame as we now are attempting to trudge through about a metre of snow whilst carrying our bicycles. <laughs> and we have no idea how far it is to the end. <laughs> this is too long, this way. Which way are we going to go, though? Along the river? Yeah. And what's that going to do? Okay. Mountaineering 101. When there's more than two metres of snow, always resort to your backside for more surface area and less chance of sinking in an avalanche, especially when pushing a bicycle. Oh yeah, that's a really good feeling on my tush. So I think we gotta cross this creek to get to the highway. Snow was fun for a little bit. My team said, Taylor, you can do this trip as long as he's not doing anything stupid. And I was like, guys, you trust me. I got this. You know what? I got it. I made it across the creek. Took my shoes off like a real pro. <laughs> okay. Now I gotta walk up that steep hill. Real lucky guy. That climb. It's a solid, it's a solid climb. Poor old Taylor, he was. You could see he just about had enough. We had to do a creek crossing and he was just like, I'm done with this. <laughs> so to get that, we gotta go down it. The weather's coming in. There's another climb. It's better now. 
It's a solid day. Right. I'm gonna go triathlon style for the descent. As much as I resent the way that what they do to long socks, kinda I think today it might be a good option. So just gonna pull the long ones on and uh, show triathletes what long socks really should be worn for climbing to the top of a snow-covered mountain pass and then pulling them up for the for the descent to keep the calf muscles a little bit warm on the way down. So how bad was the creek? Oh, it was pretty chilly. You know, when the, every drop of the water comes from uh, the snow, it's pretty chilly. But on the bright side, my shoes were quite dirty. So it was a good way to give them a bit of a clean mid-ride. You don't often get that opportunity when you're out training, so yeah, you know, saved a little bit of work for after the ride. So where there's a negative, there's always always a positive. Having five hours sleep and then like arriving at altitude, you cannot feel any worse. So it doesn't matter if you're lying in bed or on the bike. So to be honest, out there with you guys, I completely forgot about how horrible I felt. The one thing I did notice is I found it more difficult to talk as the elevation increased like you're climbing a you know like an absolute whore biscuit of a climb and then like an absolute harry harlot of a descent you know with twisty dirty turns and then bike with loose bolts so you know you got a few issues there and and then you bomb down into a tent you know you get pulled over by the police so that was that was quite amazing i mean i got my first business card from a policeman and other a unique experience hey I'm pretty proud. It's like a big day. She just stopped in. She just did it. Just touch and go for a while then. <laughs> I wasn't sure we were going to make it. Off to Aspen today via um, Leadville. Which is pretty cool. I like Leadville. Easy living at 10,500 feet. <laughs> yeah, it runs in pretty good spirits. We were all a bit buckled last night. I'm pretty tired, but this morning everyone seems to be pretty motivated, even though it's snowed a shitload outside and it's pretty cold. It's like 90 miles, 95 yeah, 90 miles of road. So it'll be long. It'll be long, but. We're staying at someone. Cam's lined us up with one of his friends, so we're staying at their house tonight, which is pretty sweet. Um, and what else? That's it. We need to find some. We need to find some uh, breakfast. Some breakfast. I think <laughs> we were all struggling last night. Man. Yeah. <laughs> I was struggling last night. I was feeling really fine actually. When I, you know, like, I think it was just you. <laughs> I don't think <laughs> you were really I think fine. about it actually. <laughs> you were falling asleep. I could eat the crutch out of a low flying duck. So let's go. <laughs> Yesterday was pretty, pretty big time, and uh, nah, today we got some up, we got some down. Yesterday it seemed like we only had a climbing up to Loveland. I, I, I kind of stopped forming memories. I was like, I was just so tired from the whole day, and leading the charge through the snow. <clears throat> We got to Loveland and I was just like, I had nothing. I couldn't go harder or slower than, than what I was than what I was doing. And then like, my dad was driving, and uh, we got to like the last switchback on 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 Loveland, which is still a ways of a little bit of a ways to the top. And he had stopped on the side, and I was going so slow that he if he can't run really because of his Parkinson's, like he can't really run very well. He could. He, he put his hand on my back and he pushed me for like 20 meters, man. And I was just like, he put his hand up. I was like, no. Like in my mind, I was like, don't do that, man. Like it's not a race. Like it's, I'm just riding up Loveland Pass. Like I'm so tired. But then it's the same thing. Like at the same time, you're like, oh man, I fucking love you, Dan. Yeah. Taylor has always been a and very interesting and interested in things kind of a kid. I would say that he wasn't predestined to be a bike racer, but in a sense, he had all the qualities that predisposed him for being really good. 
but his mentality has always been to be very playful and, and not take things on the surface too seriously. But deep down, he's, he, he definitely invests himself in whatever he's doing. Taylor has a, a different sort of talent on the bicycle than I have. But, but what I would say is that compared to me, there's interesting parallels. Um, when I was, I, I spent a half a year out of the sport from an injury in my knee and grew my hair long. And this was on the heels of having plowed my face through a windscreen in, in this race in Belgium, Liège, Fest on Liège. And so, so I, I definitely went through a, not, not, a, not a wild period, but just a self-evaluation and why I was doing what I was doing and, and what I wanted out of my life. And I think that that's, in some sense, what he's been forced to reckon with over the last year part. I think it's a, it's a great adventure that, he, that he's going on. And I think it fits well with, with his mind frame right now. And, and so to have an adventure with some good guys and find out maybe a little bit more about yourself and, and your passion for life, for cycling, whatnot. This, you know, I mean, I have a lot of respect for that, for that journey. Can't stop camp, man. Kim never, never tires. Never tires. <laughs> Gets into the bar, asks if he can chop some wood. They say no, he chops wood anyway. Yeah. So we're just fine. We yeah. don't need any wood chop. <laughs> I've been here all my life. So probably, I'm going to say 65 years I've been in here as a child. Heck yeah. You know, the family's been here forever since 1908. I mean, 1872. Really? Oh, yeah. My mm -hmm. grandparents came over from Austria. Oh, so I usually start through. anywhere from 8.30 to 9 o'clock in the morning. And when it gets busy and stuff, we're open till 2 every in morning. morning. Really? Yep. I'd rather go back to the 70s and 80s yeah. anytime. Yeah? Is it fun? You're darn right. Compared to now, you yeah. betcha. <laughs> this part right here is all original. So Except how old, this, so how old is this part? I built now? this about 10 years ago. But the rest is all original. It started up in 1878. I have it up for sale now. My wife passed away two months ago, so, you know, I've pretty well had it. I want to do something else with the rest of my life, but I want to travel. Yeah. Get back to traveling everywhere I can go, yep. Probably stay in the United States, more likely. Uh, I'm not too much in riding bikes and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I'd rather walk. See these dollars on the roof here? That's for a Super Bowl party. Once a year, we take it down and have a big Super Bowl party. The Super Bowl party oh, yeah, last yeah. year? Well, it depends if they are, the Broncos are there, it's always great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Is that your school bus there? Is that I bought that bus? years ago, I used it for storing stuff. Yeah. It still runs and everything. Does it run? Yeah. I was going to make a big camper out of it, but didn't have time, so. Yeah. yeah. Rowing I, was one sport I hadn't tried, so of course I wanted to try it. Loved it, and then I, 15, 16, went to watch the Sydney Olympics, of course, got the bug, wanted to go to the Olympics. So rowing was the sport that I was best at that was an Olympic sport. So committed to that, went to the Olympics, did that, but I never really, I mean, I, I didn't really have a huge passion in rowing. I just wanted to go to the Olympics. I wanted to do well. It was sort of like a means to an end. And I had tendonitis in my wrist and spent a bit of time on my bike when I was in Europe. Uh, that season rowing 
and uh, seemed to enjoy that more. I guess the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. And so I thought, bugger it, I'll give it a go. And at the time, it was more of an arrogant thing. I thought, I'll just show that I can do another sport as well as I could do rowing. But yeah, I got hooked on it. And uh, that was that. Because I was at the top level in one sport, I didn't want to start another one and not be at the same spot. So I had a real drive and hunger that year to make it into the national team. That was my big goal. You know, so I won Oceania. Then I came here to America, did a couple of races and felt I was good. And a mate, Josh Wilson and Richie Port said, I'll come and race amateurs in Italy. So I went there and then when I got there, I went to Shane Bannon. I said, you know, what do I have to do to get my world spot? And he laughed at me. He said, get your head out of the clouds. And I said, well, I'm serious. I really want to do the worlds. He said, I bet you do, but you, you know, you're miles off the mark. And I said, okay, well, what do I have to do? Anyway, he called me a few days later and told me I had to win a time trial, Chrono Champignoir, and he'd put me in the world's team. So righto, beauty. Won the race by 0.8 of a second. And um, that was it, I made the world's team. That was pretty crazy. Like in 12 months, like 12 months before I'd done the rowing worlds and then 12 months later I'd done cycling. And so although I wanted to do that, it all happened so fast. All of a sudden I didn't really have a choice. I had to, you know, continue in cycling. And I remember it was funny seeing Taylor today, he had his Garmin on his back of his bike. And I don't know why, but that world's, they started me 11th from the end. And I started in front of David Miller. I had a flat tire on the first lap and when we changed it, Miller was coming after me and so as he, he, he sort of caught me just as I flatted, so I had to wait for him to pass the car, got the, got the wheel, got back on the bike and I was angry so I chased him and I could see him, I chased him. As I pulled up alongside, I remember seeing his power meter monitor under his seat so he didn't want to watch it and I had an SRM on and I was looking at it, it was like 403 watts. I was like, I can do 410. Just gassed it past him. <laughs> And then, uh, you know, then he passed me on every descent. Then every time we went on the flat, I'd pass him again. So I spent the whole second lap, you know, match racing him. I met Cadell at the Nationals the next year. And he was funny. Like, the first thing he said to me, he said, who set you up on your bike? I said, man, I've never. <laughs> what do you mean? I did. So he, he said, well, when you come back to Europe, I want to take you to the Mappe Centre. So he took me along there and we did a bike fit. And, and then he got me to do a VO2 test. And when I was there, Aldo Sassi came into the room to check out what was going on and Anyway, I didn't even see him. Did the test, that was it. About three days later, I got an email from him saying that he you know, saw me do the test and thought you know, that I've got something, you know, knew my background and asked to work with me. And then during that, period, that, that time, Basso was serve, Ivan Basso was serving his, his band, his drug band. So he was there training with Aldo. He wanted to come back clean and all that and was doing it with Aldo. And so Aldo decided, thought it would be great if Basso and I trained together. And so that's, you know, what we did through his band and so forth. And I spent a couple more years in the amateurs and then, you know, finally it was time to go into a world tour team. And, and, and you know, Aldo basically felt that it was best I went with Basso because uh, we got along really well and thought I'd learn a lot from him. And, and that was that. And I remember speaking to Cadell and he said to me that, because I'd also spoken to BMC and, and Saxo Bank and, at the time and, Cadell said that it was better I went to liquid gas because Italians, if you're new and you're good, they all talk about it. And especially if you're a decent person. If you're bad and you suck and you're an idiot, yeah, they'll talk about that too. But I think you should go to liquid gas. So it was his roundabout way, I hope, of giving me a compliment. That or he didn't want to be my teammate. Yeah, that was a bit messy in there. <laughs> At the oh, altitude what? car. Yeah, we got snowed on pretty hard down the bottom. Sorry, sorry. You hit this last section, which is really steep, or like steeper. It starts switchbacking. Then <coughs> the sun came out, man. It's like, it's unreal. It's been an awesome day. We're headed down to uh, Hotchkiss, Colorado. Um, we've heard the ride's really nice. Really? Um, yeah, it might rain later in the afternoon, but it should be predominantly downhill. But, I mean, we'll see. <laughs> but that's, in theory, it should be downhill. Um, so, yeah, it'd be nice. I think we've got a few um, locals who've decided to come and roll out with us for a while, which would be fun. Um, so, yeah. It's gonna be good. <clears throat> so it's obvious today 
I'm, you know, going a bit more vogue, catching, trying to fit in with the guys a little bit more. I've had, we've had the two more racy days, a bit more serious, sort of, you know, dress myself more for the thing. So with the vogue, I decided, you know, I want to make sure I not only look great, like look really good, but also smell exceptional, you know, a bit there too. Just to really, really top all this off, make it a real complete package. So, you know, bit of, bit of polo. You know, I don't think you get much more vogue than that. Hey! Stop! 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 Dude, what did you get? <laughs> Mate, like Lance wasn't in town, so I thought the only way to remind him that we were here was to steal something. <laughs> why did you, and this why did was, you steal the golf class? Well, <laughs> I know how much Lance loves his golf, so I'm hoping it's his favourite golf bag. Because that's just going to break just, that man. We, the defining moment in us will be beating Lance at golf while using his golf bag. <laughs> That's the next challenge. Yeah, I think you kind of burnt that hard. bridge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we might want to get our asses to Hotchkiss. Right? So these, uh, th these are steer that are um, raised for a specific person and then slaughtered and, and they all have their steaks and their tenderloins and everything in their freezer now. And the reason that we know this is because it has a bullet hole in, in the uh, skull. So this steer was loved dearly until his dying day. We got two huge scores today. Lance Armstrong's golf bag and a steer skull. I didn't mean to, but just by fault, I've come up completely through the Italian system, and um, which was great. But you know, I it mean it meant again that I was really winging it a lot. You know, I didn't really understand the language the whole time. You know, missed a lot of things, and um, and uh, as great as it is being in the country, like it, it eventually it just became tiring you know like everything was just that little bit more difficult and then you realize now like you said the anglo pars and everything else it doesn't need to be difficult the most important thing is that when you turn up to race you're at your best and you race well you don't have to be a hero by doing it the hard way i've seen you know quite a few guys that have been quite successful and uh and come either to the end of their career or still getting towards the end of it and not wanting to let go and you and they've got nothing else. It's been their whole life. It's really sad to see that that the sport can take away basically the best years of a lot of people's lives. And they can be great years for them, but they can also have some really tough ones. And it's all great when everything goes well. It's awesome. But if it's the only thing you've got and then things get tough, it can be really challenging. And uh, it's not easy for people to deal with those things. Okay, my name's Sally and you're in Hotchkiss. I've been tending bars since 1976. Really? Do you yes. like tending bars? Well, I must. I fed three kids and got them through school and they never went without shoes or groceries. <laughs> I've been here probably 11, 12 years. Sometimes it's fun and sometimes it's not. I like people. Yeah. Do you get to meet a lot of people here? Oh yeah. So I had Joe Cocker come in. Really? I had the Dave like? Matthew bands come, come in. I had Marshall Tucker band come in. Uh, I've had, I've seen a few. If I could go back to back when, I would go to school to be in public relations because of the vibes that I feel and the vibes I know I can yeah. keep your noses clean, clean, stay away from the drugs. Just be the nice boys that you are now, and you'll be all right. Thank you so much. Thank you so it's much. It's been a pleasure. It's been, it's been my pleasure. <laughs> I'm from New York City, so this is like a whole new world to me. So, yeah, that's... When, he met, I, when I met him, he took me fishing. I showed up in stiletto. I'm used to, I'm used to fishing on a yacht or a pier, you know? Now, here I 
here I am. <laughs> so how long have you been here now? 15 years. Everybody is friendly. Everybody kind of knows everybody, which is nice. You go to the grocery store, they say, hi, Carrie, how are you? You know, they know each other. Whereas here in the city, you don't get that warmth, you know? So you have that warmth but out it's here. Harder. Yeah. And like, okay, give you an example. One day, I, I had, we haul water to get water. Mm. I don't know how to haul up mm. my, I can't hook the trailer up, okay? Oh, okay. So, and we were out of water. I came down in the barn and I said, is there somebody here that can help me hook up my trailer? I had several guys hop in my car, drive down, hook up my trailer for me so that I could haul water. You don't get that in the city. Because Cam gave us the wrong info for his flight, um, we've got to change the route. It's probably going to be a bit longer in total, but we've got to go through Grand Junction so we can drop him off for his flight in the morning. So, um, yeah, we're going to ride across there. I think it's going to be about 90 miles again. Um, and Taylor's just sussing out the route, but it looks pretty epic. We roll into this bar, this this little dive bar in, in town in Hotchkiss and there's all these dollar bills stapled to the wall and this really nice old lady, you know, pulling drinks for everybody and and Lachlan comes up to me and he's like, hey man, there's a guy who used to hang out with your dad back there. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> you know, we're in this tiny, weird, little bar kind of in the middle of nowhere this town is sort of shutting down you know there's all these restaurants and businesses up for sale and and so this guy came over and he and he told me this story about how my dad and him uh, and their friend rented a place in Jackson Hole for the winter and told me how my dad got drunk one night and, and puked all over his VW bus and my dad had actually told me that story when I was 15, the first time I, the first time I ever really embarrassed myself in front of, in front of my dad, you know, from drinking. And he kind of, to console me, told me this story about how he, how he threw up in the middle of winter on this, on a, this guy's car, and, and they woke up the next day and it was all iced over on the side, and, and so I, I met that guy. I met that guy whose car it was that my dad threw up on in 1978, when he was 19 years old. I think back to 2007 when I was trying to qualify for the Olympic Games in Beijing in 2008. I was still in high school. Uh, I was racing domestically. Um, I had done, you know, media here and there, like at races, you know, every time I got a write-up in cycling news, I'd be like really excited. But that year, because I was so young and because I was, you know, pretty good at, at the individual pursuit, um, I gained all this interest from U.S. news media, so I went through like really intensive media training at the age of 17, and I'm doing these like NBC nightly news interviews where I'm just like up and it's like here's the best me, and you kind of you know what people want to hear, and you know what's going to be a good answer, you know, kind of it's to me it's like what is the most mediocre but like good answer. It's got to be like kind of boring, but then you got to have a smile. This light bulb went off in my brain that I've basically been trained to say a lot of the things that I've said in the media over the course of my entire career, you know, and you learn how to present yourself and you learn what people want to hear from you. And it can be something that kind of like sucks the real you outside of who you are. You know, like you had said, express your voice in a, in a way that is not like jumping into interview mode, which is something that I caught myself doing the first day, you know, before we left was like, you were asking me about my leg and rehab and like the last year and stuff. And I have this, like, I have so many answers in my head, just like programmed, you know, like what I'm gonna say to, who I'm gonna say it to. And 
doesn't really change much. It'll change every time a little bit. Yeah. But <clears throat> I was just like, shit, like, that's not what this is about, man. Like, break out of that. Yeah. Like, break out of that. And you kind of wish that you could break out of it all the time. But you sit down and you go to these press conferences in Belgium before a tour of Flanders, before Peru Bay, and it's the same fucking question that you got last year. And it's like, you know, how is the form? How is the fitness? How are the legs? And like, what the fuck else are you going to say? Like, every year I'm just going to tell you that, like, yeah, I'm the lightest I've ever been. I'm the fittest I've ever been. I have so much experience, more experience than last year. So I'm going to go into this race with all of that. And then we'll just see what happens, yeah. you know, but you can't like they don't ask any questions that are going to prompt any answer that's any different than that. So this past year, I spent just a lot of time, you know, completely on the opposite end of, of that spectrum of like presenting myself because I had that time and I had that space from the media and from my team and from the sport to where I could just do whatever I wanted as a 24 year old and think back to what I really wanted and what I loved to do when I was a kid before it was like, okay, you're really good at this, like, and go for it and boom. And then you flash forward like nine years later and then here's that same kid, but he's in this whole different body and this brain that like knows how to present himself in this certain way, but the, the kid's still in there, you know? <laughs> Yo! Yeah. You got you a bit of a biker man yourself. What's that? No, no. Actually, I just found this in a thrift store. <laughs> Honestly, yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't, I don't like it all. Yeah, yeah thanks. You appreciate that. That, that is awesome. Isn't that, that crazy, crazy, man? But yeah, absolutely, dude. Right. Yeah, this is like, rad. So, a lot of times, yeah, they're just they're literally just growing. They grow like little stalks, kind of. And I've you look at the dead ones that are kind of from last year, mm. and it's like, oh, yep, yeah, they're right there. Sure enough. Wow. It's just incredible. Mm. Hey guys, have a freaking chow down on this shit. Yeah, come on over. It's, it's a wow. sparrow. Giving free hand ups. Come on over, guys. <laughs> it's unbelievable. We just seen all these guys hard work. Oh, <laughs> at the bar last night, there was a lady there telling us about how she loves going walking and picking asparagus, and we're like, You're like what, what the? the? Yeah, seriously. Like, that's, that's guys walking yeah. to pick asparagus. Yeah, exactly. And then now we've tried. Now you see me? Actually, yeah, exactly. Awesome. Yeah. So where are you guys headed today? Huh? We're still in Beans. Grand Junction. Oh, damn. Okay. Man, how's the weather been holding up for you guys? It's been really lucky. Yeah. It's gonna go over the Grand Mesa. Oh, nice. That's gonna be fucking gorgeous, guys. Really? It's a oh, nice. dude, it's a it's a beautiful, beautiful drive right there. It's 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 but kind is of it insane. Snowing and chilly up there at the moment? Yeah, you know, it might be. Might <laughs> be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. I I find that it's becoming harder and harder as cycling as a sport continues to develop and more money gets thrown into a sport. As you get up to a higher and higher level, like so many things are controlled for you. Everything about my professional life is sponsored and you know, like those are the people that pay you and that's why you race your bike is so that you can get paid. But <clears throat> it doesn't, it takes away that freedom to kind of express yourself genuinely as a human by being able to choose how you present yourself because we have restrictions on Twitter, Instagram, you know, ev pretty much e everybody in the world tour has some sort of restriction on like what you can say in the media. And like, I've always gotten in trouble, you know, with my team over the, over the years because I've had a really difficult time, like fully giving up all of this control that I have over like all of these little things. and. It's such a delicate thing to talk about to where I don't know if we can even put what I just said in the movie. That's probably the hardest thing for me. I think about it like the races that I want to do, the biggest things that I want to achieve and win, you can't do without the controlling aspect of being a, a world tour bike rider. Um, we kind of picked this road. Didn't really know what it was about. <laughs> it's pretty soft with mud here, so it's a bit, a bit of a slog. Um, but Everybody's clogged up. Yeah, yeah. There's Ooh, just. Did your bike jam? Yeah, just like the bike's totally clogged with. Mud. How bad were you caked up? Fully caked up, like, like this. Impossible to move. <laughs> yeah, man. We'll send you guys back around to Delta. Okay.
going on there, Gus? They didn't have, didn't get enough time in the river the other day. No, we didn't. We just came down this, this little detour, <laughs> and um, it was all like a really loose clay, wet clay. And our bikes are just completely jammed up. Like they don't work. Shoes, shoes don't work. Like it, I guess the funny thing is, there's a good there's a good chance that when you go 100 metres further down, the same thing will happen to your bike again. Yeah, yeah. Probably a better than a good chance. <laughs> Lock? No. Okay, how's the, how's the temperature of this river compared to uh, the first day? Chilly. A bit chilly. Same snow, I <laughs> Same snow. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, man? It's cold, dude. <laughs> We're on the clay trail. We're in claymation. We're making a claymation movie. <laughs> and see them boots? Yeah, I got them, them boots are made for walking. <laughs> that was pretty fucking hard. Yeah. <laughs> we went about two kilometers <coughs> in probably 45 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> but. Looks like we're through the worst of it. Down there's Delta. Oh, is that one or that one? I don't know. We get Delta's to one of those. Valley. Then we can uh, <coughs> take stock. Ooh. Push on. <laughs> that was awesome. I'm so glad we went that way. <laughs> <laughs> what flat number is this, Cam? <laughs> well, technically it's the first one we've actually gone down. We've had a lot of false alarm flats. So, How stands that's Standed by me so well thus far on the trip, finally oh, no. fucking let me down. Oh, no. So I was going to buy shares in the company. They can go and get fruck now. <laughs> yeah, Taylor's yeah. definitely taking the, the front row right here. Can't break the seal. It's tubes there, but there's no Where's tube. Where's the tie levers? Where's the tie levers? Fucking hell. Yeah. What's this shit? Yeah, I don't know. Put a fucking single on there, Cam. Yeah. You know you get to that point in a race where you're like... Off the bike, you feel terrible and tired. Yeah. Like champion, lucky. Bike, you feel amazing. I reckon we could probably... Is that you? Yeah, get some yeah. fucking muscle into it. Hey, it seems to get a little bit. What? I thought rowers had strong hands, man. No. <laughs> We've got rhythm and timing. Stands by me. Oh, you didn't. Stands by me. Stands. <laughs> you got a rim it, mate. <laughs> yeah, just to increase the challenge. It's something we haven't had to do yet. Oh. I'm going to park it in your ass. That was probably the most epic 10Ks <laughs> I've ever done. Oh shit. It's called the Badlands, the Adobe Badlands, and it's spot on. Like, it's bad in there. <laughs> There's nothing good that comes out of there. We're only 15 miles from like where we started, 20 miles from where we started. <laughs> we're right I mean, like, like, four hours. like, there's towns right here. We're still just like in the middle of fucking nowhere. There's always that little time where you go into like sportsman interview mode and you're like, yeah, like, yeah well. The tires worked perfectly <laughs> until they didn't, but that was my fault. Yeah. Never the product. This is all just the product is perfect. Is it? Except his bike's the only one that broke. <laughs> so, you yeah, know. Like today, we had no idea what we were getting in for. And then, all of a sudden, like, you weigh over your head and, like, you just have to improvise and like work it out you know like all of a sudden you sort of tap into a part of yourself that you just you don't otherwise I mean the, the thing is that there's no one making you do it and I think that's why like you're so determined to do it you know because you're like it would have been so easy just to turn around that it would have been like 5k back the other way but you just like I just want to do it so if someone had told me I had to run through that section in a race I'd be like fuck that you know? <laughs> because we 
we decided to do it. We just made it happen. When you put guys in this situation, you see a totally different side of it. Um, and it brings you closer for sure. Um, but yeah, we are like very much a group now, you know, like it's very, we're just pushing on together. You're not going to do the whole Sorry. thing anyway, so... <laughs> so Cam's bike, you just can't get it right. Um, the tube, we pinch flatted it, and... It's because it's got these special wheels on it. So, anyway, he's just going to ride it flat into town and see if he can, can't find a bike shop that can fix it. Hey, Roo, mate. Hey, Roo. Hey, Roo. Hey, Roo. Hey, Roo. Fucking beating it is so tight. Piece of shit. You just get to that point where you only feel good when you're riding your bike, but you don't really want to ride your bike. Marginal losses, man. Marginal losses. <laughs> Any luck? No, because you can't take out this valve. It's not a removable valve. Now he's just going to quickly check. He threw that other one in the bin. If it's got a removable valve, and jam that in. Well, try to. If it doesn't, it's right. I can test out how strong these rims are. 60k, I think. I mean, ideally, you just have a freaking tyre that you can take off, put a tube inside, put the tyre back on, and then pump up the tyre. That's like pretty standard. <laughs> what kind of riders ahead on that stretch? I don't really know. I think it's going to be pretty boring, pretty flat, potentially headwind. Pretty tough. <laughs> uh, I don't think we're looking forward to it. <laughs> but we've got to get it done. It's as bad as I think it's going to be. I know it's going to be worse for Cam. <laughs> After exhausting his options, Cam was unable to fix his flat tyre. But Cam being Cam, he decided to push on. So what's going on with the tube that's in there? It's flat. <laughs> For the first 30k, I was trying to push him from behind and then Gus and Taylor would, would roll in the front. We sort of had this little method going, but it was still hard going and like trying to push him was like, you know, it's such tough work. When we go fast on the downhill, um, Cam's tube, like the the valve is like making it kind of bounce and go crazy. So, we're pulling it out. <laughs> I don't think it'll make a difference, but <laughs> it's up to him. If this had to happen to anybody, it's... I hate to say it, but it's good that it happened to Cam because he's the only one who can handle it. <laughs> You could just see he was like, you're gonna make it, you know? Like he put the hammer down and just started riding as hard as he could. And I don't know, we just kind of slotted in behind him and I started to push him and then Gus came in behind me and started to push me. And then Taylor came up when he caught us and he started to push. And then all of a sudden we were just doing 45k now. I was like, <laughs> it's like, why would we do this earlier? Like, this is so much better. And then we just started hauling us, like riding as hard as we could, all pushing consistently. We'd kind of go five minutes one side, and then when your arm would fatigue, we'd do, we like had a really synchronized swap. And then we keep going. And we, I think we ended up doing the last 30K in like under, oh, I think it was like, 45k an hour average, and he had a flat tire. The thing that got me was, was I've really struggled in the sport, and and recently realised I've I've really found it hard to find my my spot, my hole, and the only way for me to try and find that was by taking myself out of it. 
do I fit in? Do I not fit in? Am I good enough? Am I not good enough? What, whatever. And the fact of the matter is, I'm like you guys. I, I genuinely want to see my teammates, see whoever around me do well. When I see a, even another rider struggling, I, I instinctively want to help them. And in this sport, often that's not, that's not rewarded. But today, being with you guys, made me realize there's other guys like that in the group as well, that you just have to find them. And for the first time ever, I really felt like I can belong in the sport. I can happily be myself, be, have that mentality, and it'll be rewarded at some point. So for me, the greatest thing was seeing such great athletes uh, not think about themselves for, for a moment. You know, there's, there's such a, a thing of selfishness in, uh, well, particularly in cycling, you know, and that's something I really struggle with. It shows that it doesn't matter what level you are, you know, how good you are, how famous you are or whatever, there's a place to just be yourself. You don't always have to be that, uh, that cutthroat. I realise there's a few other guys at least in the group. And there's others out there that I'm close to too, but particularly you guys, that I've finally found a spot in the bunch. And it really doesn't matter what everyone else thinks because at least I'll have a few guys that I can relate to, that I know will be there for me if I need something, I can be there for them. And when all of us are successful, we'll all enjoy that together. So for me personally, it's been, it's, it's made me extremely motivated to get back in the peloton and race. It's made me let go. It's made me not care at the end of the day if you're performing and doing the right thing by your team and your whoever else. That's all that really matters. You don't have to play the game or toe the line or try and be someone else because there's a, a, a culture or whatever that says you should. You can just happily be yourself. And knowing that there's other guys out there in the group that are the same, um, for me, that's been the most, that's been the most amazing, the most amazing thing. Man, you're in lifesaver. After only just revealing that he had to leave the country a day before Moab due to his visa expiring, Cam slept through several alarms and was now late for his flight. Yeah, May 25 from Grand Junction is now departing at 7.42. You can check flight status, so perfect. So we've got plenty of time. Which is a really good lesson that if you're gonna go out and have a really big night, you know, like when you're planning on going somewhere, Make sure that when you do it, the plane is going to be delayed. Like it's going to, you know, an extra couple of hours because things can often go wrong, which they did today. As hard as it can be in the mornings, when you walk out to the car and realise that Lance has already got to the car. Like again, first here. Unbelievable. Must have been out of bed at like four o'clock. There he is on the roof. Ready to go. Classic. So we're all good. I made the flight. Luckily it was delayed. Um, which I planned for. I, uh, I heard, I watched a movie once where flights out of Grand Junction were delayed. So I played for that, got some extra sleep. That's why I feel so great this morning. <laughs> I'm hurting. <laughs> what do you want to know? <laughs> you guys got in like what, five? Like four. Yeah. So we met this guy named David and he was like super nice and super charismatic and like, yeah, just became our friend, and then he's like, oh, come with me, like, we'll go to this house party. I'm like, that sounds awesome. So we walked for, like, an hour through the, through the suburbs of Grand Junction, like, just walking with this big group of people that we'd never met before, and ended up at this, like, tiny little house, drinking this weird moonshine. Like, we kind of rolled in there, and it was just Lockie, Cam, and I, and we're having a chuckle and talking to everyone, and they pulled out this big jar, and had, like, a chilli in it, like, a pickle in it. <laughs> and then I drink this. Oh my god, it was so brutal. 
And then next thing we know, it was like three in the morning. We're like, shit, we better get home. Like, how do we get home? So we ran the streets for a while and found our hotel. And then, uh, and then yeah, so it was 4 a.m. And we're brutally hungover this morning. Like, man, that moonshine was the worst idea we've had. We got like 110 miles to do today uh, across to Moab. I would go through Fruta um, and then, yeah, hopefully get onto the back roads and, and cruise in. Um, but yeah, still a pretty big day actually, so trying to get on the road early. Which we tied one on a bit last night, but all's good. How are you feeling now? I'm not too bad. I think Gus is a bit yeah. more dusty. I've sort of come good, but I think Gus is a bit hurting. But we'll see. <laughs> As we start riding, it might be a different story. I guess the way that I started to think about things um, in my recovery when I was contemplating the idea of never being able to race again, um, I realized that there's about three people's opinions of me that I really care about. And as long as those three people are like, happy with me as a person and with what I'm doing, Nothing else really matters, you know? Like, I think a lot of people get caught up in like, oh, like, your team needs you, and your fans need you, and the sport needs you, but it doesn't, you know? It's gonna work out fine if you're not there. So I, I removed that. I was able to kind of remove that and, and see things a bit more clearly, and for sure, for sure, the idea of walking away from a sport that's treated me really well and continues to treat me really well, that's daunting. And it's not something you really want to think about, but it's, there's so much else in life, man. So that idea of a, of a simpler life is for sure pretty cool. Um, I, I sort of made a decision that I, there's a couple things that I really want to achieve in the sport of cycling, and I'm gonna spend some time trying to achieve those things. I'd love to win Milan San Remo, I'd love to win Perry Roubaix, I'd love to wear the yellow jersey at the Tour de France, you know, like I still have motivation and a hunger to get back to professional cycling. And uh, at the same time, I also know that I don't have what it takes to accomplish everything because there's so much that you have to throw away. There's so many years of your life that you have to in essence, throw away. We're about to jump on the Coco Pelli Trail. I mean, we could also go ahead. A little bit of a dirty detour. That's what we like. Should be a nice little trail. When you're young, like the reason you play team sports, I think, is because the, the camaraderie with your friends or with your teammates, you get to achieve like a collective goal. Like everyone succeeds. And then you get to like 12 or 13 and all of a sudden it's like you're playing the local comp, local rugby comp, and then two of the guys out of the team get picked to go play the next level up. And then from that, two more get picked and they pull. And so it changes from just being about playing together as a team it becomes about, well, I need to excel in some little individual way in order to get picked to go to the next level. And then it's the same when you're working in your job. And so when Cam got that flat tire yesterday, it was the first time in probably like, like 15 years and that there was that genuine camaraderie. That's what I think was a really powerful thing because all of a sudden it is possible to do something with no other outcome but just to like get each other to the finish. For me, it was a genuinely moving thing. Like I'm gonna remember every single meter of those 60Ks for the rest of my life. Uh, we just passed the town of Cisco, which is a ghost town. Uh, we went through the Cocopelli Trail and we lost the car uh, with all the water and all the food and lamps. Um, so we're a little bit stranded out here in the desert. It's sweet out here. It's definitely 
a wild climate change, scenery change from where we started in Boulder. Honestly, I don't really want to go home. I kind of want to just stay, just pack up a backpack and then just keep riding. But I always say things like that and it never actually happens. We miss Cam, we miss the diesel. The ro robot. The robot diesel, but we made up for him today, man. We've just been, just been pushing it. Just, just talked to Kevin. It's pretty close. Doesn't have any water. But he has some Coca Cola. Coca Cola is made with water, so we'll be fine. <laughs> That's a good too. We're here. Oh, chips? Haven't had chips in a while. That was awesome, man. That was one of the best bits of ride I've ridden, I think. The little trail was really sandy, but you could still go really fast with some rocky sections. And we were just going fly it out, like, full gas the whole time. It was awesome. If you're planning on riding into the desert, over a hundred miles. Sorry about the water. Make sure water. you That's right. We're just doing buy some water for yourself. It's got me going. Being out here in the desert with no water is still in a way preferable to being comfortable and at home and sitting on the couch. It's so vast and makes you feel so small. And as a human, it's very good to feel small. You know, we can kind of we can kind of think that we're bigger, more powerful than we actually are, and so coming out to the desert or being around big mountains, you know. Brings it back down, grounds you a little bit. About 42 miles or something, 40 miles, 50 miles. To be honest, I've got no idea. That's 40 miles. And we just punch it out. We'll do, we'll de we'll do a dehydration team's time trial. It's amazing what can happen, you know, in 24 hours on a bicycle if you just go out and enjoy your ride. All we hear about is the crap, you know, the that and blah and the UCI and Lance and blah, 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 blah. No one sees this, sees the fact that the bicycle can just bring good people together. You know, I've just all my best friends have come from just being two people out there on a bike, you know. And then this week it was it was four of us. And and I think if people can just enjoy the sport for that, let go of all that other crap, because it really doesn't matter. It's in the past. Let's just move forward. We've got a beautiful sport. Don't take it too seriously. It's, it's easy still, like it's easy to get caught and, and forget why riding a bike is, is a privilege and why being able to ride a bike for a living is an absolute privilege, you know. Um, and this is, it's just always a nice reminder to get out there and ride for the sake of riding um, and meet a bunch of people and, and see new roads and, and new places. Um, for me, that I don't think that will ever be something I don't enjoy doing. Um, and then to, to be able to share that with a new group of people um, and see what they got out of it and then have them push me further. And I like being taken out of my comfort zone because, you know, that keeps you, it keeps you pushing and, and it keeps you 
fresh, I think. So having those guys here definitely brought a new new element to it, and, and it was a positive element. I mean, I still I'm still out there just just riding our bikes around for for no real reason, and and riding really hard for really long distances for no real reason. You, you kind of got lost in the effort of the riding um, because it was so hard, and we were pushing so hard every day um, that. I mean, that in itself was an isolation. The idea of the thereabouts, it's a personal thing, you know, so for what, I mean, what this ride means to me might be different for, you know, Taylor or Cam, and I think it was.